Welcome back. You guys hear me say on the channel all the time how the ACT math section is a little unfair. That test is always throwing in topics that never appeared on the test before. By contrast, the SAT math sections are fairly predictable. I'm not saying the questions will be easy, but you can usually anticipate what you'll see on an SAT math section. The questions there, typically, are pulling from the same banks of topics on test to test. However, the SATs from the spring of 2021 each threw in a new type of geometry question that never appeared on the test before. My students saw these questions pop up on the March exam, the April school day test, and both the Saturday and the Sunday versions of the May exam. This type of question had never appeared on any previously released PSAT or on any QAS report for the SAT. And suddenly it was everywhere this spring. So odds are that you'll probably see something like it on your upcoming SAT. So in this video, we'll look at all of the variations of how this new type of question appeared on the spring tests. And if you find this helpful, please hit that like button, share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell. I'll keep you up to date on any other changes to the test as things continue to evolve. Okay, let's get into the details of what is evidently the SAT's new favorite type of question. A question from the March exam looked like this. If B equals 10 and C equals 18 in the figure above, what additional piece of information is sufficient to determine whether these two triangles are congruent? So before we start, let's look at the big picture, both literally and figuratively. This is the new type of geometry question. They're not asking you to solve for anything. Instead, they're asking if you have enough information to prove something. So you can't rely on just computation or memorizing a formula. It's more critical thinking involved. So let's see how it works on this question. You might remember seeing the triangle congruence theorems from your geometry class. Certain combinations of sides and angles will prove the triangles are congruent. Let's refresh them. In a triangle, if you could prove that the three sides of one triangle equal the three sides of another triangle, that means that the triangles are equal. It's called SSS, or side, side, side. But you could also do ASA. If an angle, side, angle, following the same order, angle, side, angle, both equal each other, that also means that the triangles are congruent. And again, following around in the same order, if a side, angle, side corresponds to a side, angle, side, those triangles are equal. You could also use AAS, angle, angle, side, or if it's a right triangle, hypotenuse leg. But no curse words, as we used to say, so ASS, angle, side, side, doesn't work. You can't use that to prove triangles congruent. An angle-angle doesn't prove congruence, but it does prove similarity. So let's see how that helps us on this question. They tell us that B is 10 and C is 18. This means that we have two of the pairs of sides already equal. So let's see how each statement might help us. That first statement says angle C equals angle D. So let's follow what we know clockwise, starting with angle C on the left. Moving around that first triangle, we have angle, then a side, and a side. Likewise, going the same direction in the other triangle, starting at angle D, moving around we also have angle, side, side. And does that work for congruence? No. Remember, you can't use ASS or angle, side, side to prove triangles congruent. So statement one doesn't work. Now, in statement two, if angle A equals angle E, would that help us? Well, let's look at that triangle on the left. Moving clockwise from side B, it means we would have a side, angle, side. And now starting on the right with the 10, also side, angle, side. And that works. Side, angle, side can be used to prove that triangles are equal. And now let's think about statement three. Statement three says that side CB equals side DH. That means all three sides on the left equal all three sides on the right. So SSS equals SSS. And that works. Side, side, side does work for congruence. So statements two and three are both true, but one is not. The answer is D. Again, this new type of question is not asking you to do any computation. It's just asking you to think about if the given information is enough to prove something, which is challenging. So let's try another. In fact, I won't even make the next one a multiple choice question. Instead, let's just use some reasoning and logic. If QT and RS are parallel, how do we know that the two given triangles are similar? I'll give you a minute. Press pause, give it a shot. So we know that those two angles that meet in the middle at P are equal. Angles QPT and RPS are vertical angles, or opposite angles, so they're equal. 
Now what? In order to prove the triangles are similar, remember, we only need two pairs of angles, so we just need one more pair. How could we do that? It's very important that the question tells us that those lines are parallel. That means that line QS forms a transversal between the two parallel lines. That means that angle Q and S are alternate interior angles. Therefore, they're equal. And the same is true about T and R. Those are also alternate interior angles. Just to help you visualize that, you could mark how angle Q is the same as angle S, or that T is the same as R. We could use either of those pairs, along with the two that we had in the middle, to start. Either way, we have angle-angle equals angle-angle. That means that the two triangles are similar. So, some of the newer questions from the spring asked about congruence and similarity, but other variations might throw in some trigonometry. Let's see how. In the right triangle LGM above, the length of side LG is 13, the measure of L is 50 degrees, and M is a right angle. Which of the following can be determined using the information given? So let's start with statement one. Can we find the measure of angle G with the given information? Well, we know that L is 50 degrees, and they tell us that M is a right angle, it means it's 90 degrees, and all three angles of a triangle have to add to 180. So we could set up the equation angle L plus M plus G is 180. Subbing in those numbers, 50 plus 90 plus G is 180, and that would be enough to solve for G. And I won't even make you solve. We don't need to. We just need to know that it's possible. So first statement is true. That one was a little easier. Now let's get into statement two. Do we have enough information to find the length of side LM? Well, let's look at what they give us. They tell us side LG and angle L. How could this help us find LM? We could use the trig ratios, sine, cosine, or tangent. How? In this triangle, we know that LG is the hypotenuse. It's across from the 90 degree angle. And they're asking if we could find LM. How does LM correspond to the given angle L? It's the adjacent of L. So we're dealing with an angle L, the hypotenuse, and the adjacent. That means we could use the cosine ratio. So going back to SOHCAHTOA, we're going to use CA, or the cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, Plugging in what we have, cosine of L would be LM over LG, and then using the numbers, cosine of 50 is X over 13. And from there, you could multiply out the 13 and solve for X. That would give you the value of LM. And again, I won't make you do it because who cares? They're not asking you to actually solve. They just want to know if it's possible. And it is. So both statements are true. The answer is C, both 1 and 2. Okay, now we're warmed up. I'll let you try the next one on your own. Question 4. In the triangle above, the length of FI is 15. Which of the following additional measurements provides enough information to determine the length of IH? I'll give you a minute. Press pause. Give it a shot. Let's start with statement 1. We already know the length of FI, which is one of the legs of the triangle. If they gave us FH, that would be a hypotenuse that would be enough to find IH. How? Pythagorean theorem. First leg squared plus the second leg squared would equal the hypotenuse squared. And again, no math to be done. We just need to know that it's possible. So if we knew FH, then we could find the third side. So statement one is true. Now let's think about statement two. Would angle H give us enough information to solve for IH? Just like the last question, we need to think about the trig ratios. How does the given side FI relate to angle H? It's the opposite, and they're asking us to find IH. In terms of H, that's the adjacent. So we have an opposite and an adjacent. So which ratio is in play? Well, think about SOHCAHTOA. We want tangent. TOA is opposite over adjacent. So using the tangent ratio, the tangent of H would be its opposite over its adjacent, and then from there, plugging in that info, that means FI over IH, and then with the numbers, the tangent of h is 15 over x. And now you can manipulate that to solve for x. No math necessary, we don't have to do it, we just need to know that it's possible. And it is. So both statements are true. The answer is c. Let's try one more. Question 5. In the figure above, which additional piece of information is sufficient to prove that the two horizontal lines are parallel? This one relates to that question we saw a few minutes ago with parallel lines and a transversal. So I'll give you a minute. Press pause. Give it a try. So let's start with those four angles on top. 
Angle 1 and 2 make up a straight line. They're supplementary, or they add to 180. 1 and 4 are opposite, or vertical angles. They're equal to each other. And 1 and 3 are also supplementary. They also make up a straight line, or add to 180. Now how do those angles relate to the 4 on the bottom? If those horizontal lines are parallel, it would mean 1 and 5 correspond. That means they're equal. Corresponding angles are both in the same spot, so to speak, that top left corner of the 4. And working with 5, we can see that 5 is supplementary with 6, 5 equals 8, and 5 is supplementary with 7. And if 1 equals 5, you could do a whole lot of substitution to come up with this. When you have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, it means any acute angle equals any other acute angle, any obtuse angle equals any other obtuse angle, and then from there, in any combination, an obtuse plus an acute would equal 180. So if we knew that angle 1 equaled angle 8, that would mean that all the other angles here would fall into place. The answer is D. That would prove that the lines are parallel. So for these newer types of questions, you don't have to do any actual math. You just need to think about what you can and can't prove. So just to go through the topics that came up on the spring, this was in play for the following. Certain combinations of sides and angles will prove that the triangles are congruent. Angle-angle will prove that the triangles are similar, but not congruent. Whenever you have two out of three sides of a right triangle, you can always find the third with Pythagorean theorem. Likewise, if you have two out of three angles, you can find the third because they all have to add to 180. You can also use the sine, cosine, and tangent ratios to help you side for a missing side of a triangle. And if you have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, it means all of the acute angles are equal, all of the obtuse angles are equal, and if you combine any obtuse with any acute, they have to add to 180. You won't find this type of question anywhere in the College Board Practice Book, or on any previously released PSAT test, or any QAS report that came out before March. But then these questions started to appear all over the place starting in the spring of 2021. So keep an eye out. You're very likely to see this type of question on your upcoming test. And if you do, be sure to leave a comment down below to let us know which test it popped up on. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.